Welcome to the Online Course Masters Show, where we learn from the best online course creators how to better create and sell our very own courses. I'm your host, Phil Ebener, and today I chat with Dr. Claire Lynch, who is making a few hundred dollars on Udemy per month for about 18 months until her income shot up to over $10,000 in March of 2017. Let's hear how she did it, coming right up. Visit OnlineCourseMasters.com for show notes to watch the video version of this episode and see an archive of all our past guests. Please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please, if you haven't done so already, leave a review for this show wherever you listen to it. Now, let's get straight to the interview. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. And I'm with Claire Lynch, Dr. Claire Lynch, all the way from UK. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm excited to share your story with the listeners. And I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people and hopefully help them and inspire them to just stick with it and grind it out because there is light at the end of the tunnel. So welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So for people who don't know anything about you, can you just share your background? What what is your life story summed up in a, in a couple of minutes? And what, what have you been doing before you started teaching online courses? Okay, well, the complete life story is that I spent um, the large part of my 20s and um, some of my 30s being an eternal student. So I, I ended up doing a PhD at Cambridge, um, thought I might become an academic, but decided instead to um, get a job because I just couldn't face being poor anymore. And Beowulf wasn't enough to tempt me away from, from a, a living wage. So I, um, I've i been working as a writer since then. Uh, I worked for the Financial Times um, and worked as a copywriter. And for the past 12 years, uh, me and my husband, David, who's a big partner in my Udemy story, um, <clears throat> Uh, we have been running a small uh, writing consultancy based in London, serving corporate clients. So what we do is we work with anyone who needs to write as part of their job. And traditionally, that has involved providing the words for them, so doing copywriting services, but increasingly training people to write. Mm -hmm. um, and so the move into online training was a sort of a bit of a natural move, I suppose. Yeah, and there's so many words out there. Every, I mean, I feel like every business needs someone to be writing something, and I've learned for myself that wasn't, and still I would say is not my strong suit, and it's not something that I ha have fun with, but I do spend so much time writing blog, blog articles, writing copy, sales copy, writing emails, <laughs> just, yeah, just yeah. lots and lots of writing. So yeah. it is an uh important skill. It, it is an important skill, and it's an incredibly transferable skill. Uh, it's something that one of my students in the course, actually, in my flagship course, he said, I feel like I'm learning some really transferable skills here. And I think, you know, that the crossover between write the written word and presenting material in a, in a video format, there's so much overlap because it's all about connecting with another person, ultimately. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one, I'm looking at your Udemy profile, and you talked about how you, in your past you've written for all these companies and you've trained students at all these different places. And this is just a quick tip for people listening. Check out Dr. Claire Lynch's Udemy profile because she starts out with her unique selling advantage, her position that sets her apart. And it's just a great way for anyone who comes to her profile automatically knows why, why should I take a t class from you? So I think that's really a, Great. And I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> so so you already were doing some consulting. So that helps a little bit in this transition to online courses. But talk about that. How did you get into teaching on Udemy? Well, one of my clients, I suppose, is the Language Center at the University of Cambridge. And the, the person that I work there who heads up, um, she heads up the part of the Language Center that helps get Student, international students skilled up for the year ahead, for the academic year, and, and, and supports them throughout the academic year. And she brings me in every year uh, to help 
train the international students and get them prepared for the academic year. And I can't remember why, but I found myself on a on a call with her and one of her for, former students who was living in Hong Kong and who was a bit of an edupreneur. And he used this word MOOC. And I'd never heard of this word MOOC, mass open online course. What on earth is that? Um, but it intrigued me. And um, I went away and me and my husband, David, the other part of my company and the Udemy story, we did some research on what what were these MOOC things and looked at all the various platforms were out there and soon realized that probably Udemy was the best fit for the sort of thing that we could do. And we just felt there was nothing to lose. Let's just put something up there and see what happens. Right. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's, how, that's how it happened. And so um, that was probably about three years ago and our first course launched in March 2015. Wow, nice. Yes. And so what was, just thinking back then, what were some of the hurdles in terms of actually creating the course? Did you already know how to use a camera or audio or edit video? Like, what what was that like? No, seriously. So, well, um, I had a bit of an advantage in that I have been blogging for many years, mm -hmm. partly because I'm a writer and I just feel this need to express myself. So I would had quite a, an established blog about writing for many years. So I had lots of content. But really, my current flagship course in its first iteration was me sitting in front of a microphone reading out blog posts. So effectively, it was an audio book with some slides attached. Um, so we bought a decent microphone and, and that was it. And I didn't really start getting in front of the camera until much later on. Got it. Uh, Got so, it. Yeah. Didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how most people start. So yeah. you launched that course in March of 2015. And how did it go? What What happened? Oh, well, my first month was much better than yours <laughs> uh, because I had a um, a blog, uh, an existing blog and an existing, a small but highly engaged mm -hmm. mailing list. Um, I actually made $900 in my first um, first month on Udemy. So, wow, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, my rise has not been as stratospheric as yours has since then, because I know you famously made $62 and and now it's uh, you're in the tens of thousands every month. So a pretty good start, but then bumped along the bottom for many, many months. I mean, that was a, a good start. But then the months following that, it was probably, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a month for about 18 months. And was that all coming from your own promotions or did you see any sort of organic sales coming from you to me it was it i i am really bad at promoting myself i think it's a it's a copywriter's thing you know we are really good at selling other people but when it comes to selling ourselves you know i'm just terrible at it i'm not a really consistent marketer so a little bit of organic a little bit of my own sales um but but not a huge amount for those first 18 months yeah, I'll be, yeah. wow well i'm gonna tease a little bit we're gonna talk about this in a couple questions but i'm looking at this revenue the screen share that you sent me of your revenue report and like you said it was about 18 months of just bouncing around a few hundred dollars and then at the end of 2016 it starts it looks like mount everest you're climbing 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 and then there's this peak of over to me it looks like over ten thousand dollars in, in march yeah. so yeah. that is just so exciting but before you got there you you mentioned to me being so just hesitant about there already being star instructors in your field who have dominated you to me and i think that's something that everybody goes through starting out. They see that there's already so many courses out there. There's already people dominating my, my niche. So what, yeah. what, how did you get through that? Okay. Well, it's not even star instructors. It's one star instructor with several courses. Um, but in, in many ways, I've got him to thank for being on the platform because uh, when I first hit Udemy, type in writing, his name comes up. He's got, you know, 50,000 or more students on one course. And you do the, you know, he's charging $200 a pop and you, you do the maths and you think I'm going to be a millionaire within months. <laughs> right. um, of course, we all know that's not what happens. Um, but it, it really inspired me to get on on the on the Udemy platform. 
But yeah, uh, the whole star instructor thing, like many people, I, I probably griped a little bit about it. Now, you know, I see a lot of griping about, oh, Udemy favors certain instructors over, over others. And, you know, you certainly feel that that maybe isn't the case. But I don't feel Udemy necessarily has um, an obligation to promote you just because you're new on the platform. You kind of have to prove yourself. And so what I did was I have just constantly and consistently improved my course. I was very struck by something that Scott Duffy said on your podcast um, a few weeks ago, which was that do not make the lesser course. And I think that's absolutely the case. Do not make the lesser course. You just have to, if you don't gripe about the star instructor, become the star instructor. Um, and you know, I mean, he's still, the, this other instructor is still the star instructor, but he's got 55,000 students or something like that on one course. Every one of those students is a potential student of mine. So I'm happy about that, you know, and I, and I kind of figure if you're opening a restaurant, you want to be on the rest, you know, you want to be on the street with Gordon Ramsay and the and the other star chefs, you know? Totally. You want to be the yeah, place. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, and I've heard, too, just speaking to the Udemy team that, and it, I just know from students, they don't just buy one writing course. They don't just buy one Adobe Premiere Pro course. They might buy multiple pull of them. So there's definitely room for multiple people to be teaching the same topic. Absolutely. I mean, I've been a professional writer for what, 20 odd years, and I'm still learning. You know, if I spot a book in a bookshop that's about writing that I've never come across before, I will buy it. You know, I will read blogs about writing. So and um, you could do my course, you could do his course, and you still won't know everything there is to know about writing. So I think there's room for us both. And um, very, very different courses. We cover different material. We have different styles. There's room for there's room for us both. And yeah. I think that's true everywhere, not just on Udemy, but I get this question all the time on different courses or an email about YouTube, about websites, about courses. And it seems like a lot of people struggle with this idea of there's just there's already people out there doing it. How do I how do I get into that business? But there's just so many people out there and you're your unique person and you're going to have your unique take on everything. So just, yeah. you just got to stick with it. But what, yeah. what were the things that you did actually with your course? Like how were you improving it? You, you realized that you needed to do some things, but what were you actually doing? So the first thing I needed to do was to learn to get comfortable on camera, um, which was a big hurdle to overcome, you know, so that I could turn what was effectively an audio book with slides um, into something that was a, a properly engaging course. So I actually took myself off to uh, a course at my local community college on how to present to camera. And that's what I did. But, you know, one can learn this stuff online as well. That was just you know, way back then, that was the way I, I did it. Um, and I'd originally signed up for a course that was about how to present a camera for business, which um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, was was cancelled. And so instead, they put me on a course, a weekend course, uh, entitled So You Want to Be a TV Presenter. Mm. Um, and so there, there was I, wanting to make little videos about writing with a bunch of glamorous 20-something young women who wanted to present on MTV. Um, but... Actually, what was really great about it was that um, it kind of upped my game. And so we did things like we they took us out into the street to be sort of roving reporters doing the sort of walking and talking to camera, which has certainly influenced um, my style of, of videos on Udemy. We do a lot of location shooting and just give students something nice to look at beyond the sort of middle-aged woman banging on about words. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And so the, you also have a few classes now. And so what was your process for creating sort of the next classes after that initial one? And what was that initial one? Was that kind of your flagship course or was that a different? So the initial course was the big flagship course, which I'm still improving. I'm still um, I, I don't know if you know of the fourth bridge. Um, do you know that metaphor? No, I don't. <laughs> so um, tell me. So the fourth bridge in, is a bridge in Scotland, and when they start painting it, they get to the other end, and then they go have to go back and start painting it again. And I feel like my big flagship course is like the fourth bridge. You know, stuff that I recorded to, to camera 
a month ago now looks incredibly amateur and so I'm constantly doing that so that that's not an unfinished thing and um, we've just come back from Rome and filmed some new lectures in Rome we're going to be updating that uh, that course to make it um, to add an, a little bit of extra value um, but at the same time have done smaller courses that don't bring in as much income, but sort of bubble away and allow me to do a little bit of cross promotion. So my other course, I did did a course on report writing, just because it's something that people Google a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, just on that. Um, we've got a tiny little course on the apostrophe. And the reason um, <laughs> the reason I made a course on, on the apostrophe is because one of the most successful blog posts that I had published on my blog over the years was a, about a tiny technical issue of the apostrophe. And so there was clearly a hunger for st stuff about the apostrophe, how to use the apostrophe. And so that bubbles along nicely. And I'm planning to expand that into a general punctuation course. People love grammar. Um, yeah. They really love grammar. And I don't actually think that, that good writing is is just about grammar. It's about so much more, but people love grammar. So I'm going to be churning out more grammar. And then I have another course on, which is probably my highest rated course, um, which is about how to build a business as a copywriter and, you know, how to get decent rates from your clients and everything I've learned from the, the business side of, of running a, a copywriting business. And, and that one, that's a really sort of successful course in terms of the, the feedback and the ratings, people seem to really um, enjoy that course too. So um, I'm not a bit massive course creation machine, just four courses in two years. Um, Sometimes no. that's all, that, all it takes though. There's different strategies. And for me, I kind of just kept creating more and more courses and that led to success. But I know a lot of people who, you know, have their one course and Sometimes I think, man, if I just focus on one course, you can probably have as much success. But I love the way that you're looking at your blog articles to see what is most popular and like the apostrophe. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> that's I think that's a really important thing because it can really change how, how a sentence what a sentence means, oh, yes. <laughs> depending yes. on where it is. So yeah. that's that's cool. And yeah, now you have some different courses to kind of cross promote with each other. Mm -hmm. So, again, looking at this revenue report, in October of 2016, things start to go up. So, do you know what, what started to happen? What, what is the difference now compared to before? Hey, Phil here. Are you enjoying this episode? I really hope you are, and I hope you're learning to become a better online course creator. If you want to fast track your success, head over to OnlineCourseMasters.com and get your free trial of the full flagship program, the masterclass for online course creators. Get more information at OnlineCourseMasters.com. Well, apart from the, aside from this sort of constant improvement, this incremental just titiv titivating the, the course and making it just much more engaging, um, I have increased the engagement levels. I went to Udemy Live last year, and one of the most um, useful sessions for me was a session by one of their learning scientists where, where it was all about how to incorporate more practice activities into your course. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I took a lot of stuff away from that, and I've, I've made extra efforts to increase the engagement. So, um, you know, this time last year, I was probably answering one or two questions a month. Now, you know, I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is I, I you know, log on and there's, you know, six, seven, 20 questions from students. Is so that because not, there are more questions now because there's more engagement or just because you're answering more often now? Because I have incorporated a lot more practice activities into the course, encouraging students to post in the QA, e even something as simple as just introduce yourself which I think I probably learned from one of your courses, actually, Phil. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, and just, just getting that, that engagement. So I think that's really, really helped. Another thing that I think helped um, was uh, around about that time, a student wrote uh, a review of the course and posted it on LinkedIn. So when your students start talking about the course in their networks, not just necessarily the reviews on, on Udemy itself, um, 
it, it just felt like it was a confluence of things. There wasn't any one thing that I did, but I felt that this confluence of things meant that the course got noticed. Yeah. Um, um, you know, in the March figure, that 10,000 figure, I, I was actually picked up by Udemy for a Facebook campaign and um, people were, were buying the course for $39 and it got a lot of traction there. And so I think just just that constant chipping away and improving and, and not giving up and just little by little incremental improvements, it all seemed to come together. Yeah, I, I love it. And I love that idea of you seeing the student on LinkedIn posting the review. This isn't actually something that I've done m much of, but I've talked to other instructors who actually kind of reinforce that. And whenever a student finishes the course, they'll either share like this certificate of completion on social media and say, Hey, congrats to this student you just finished or, or they'll Bye. get everyone who finished to like somehow share on social media. I don't know how you do that, but yeah, uh, that is something I've been thinking. How can I get students to do that? Whether it's some kind of writing competition where I get them to write something and talk about the course. I don't know that, but that's definitely something to think about. Yeah. 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 So you said you wake up now and you're answering questions, yeah. but what else, is, what's like a typical day like with you balancing online teaching, but also just normal day stuff? You mentioned before we started recording that you're more of like a hobbyist in the sense that you're not <laughs> a course creation machine. This isn't like your 80 hour a week thing. So what's a, a typical day like for you? Well, I mean, I've been self-employed for 10, 12 years, so um, there is no typical day, and that's why you're self-employed, because you don't want that typical day. So, yeah, so apart from that, you know, lying in bed with my cup of tea, reading student questions, from, from that point on, the day could, could go in any various directions. So today I've been preparing materials for some corporate training for a big asset manager in the city that I'm going to be doing in, in a week or two's time. Um, you know, I may do some scripting. I, I tightly script all my Udemy lectures. So um, if I'm scripting, then it's head down. And, um, you know, that's probably the one thing I'm really, really disciplined about is anything that involves writing. If it's a nice day, um, I might say to Dave, my husband, should we go out and do some location shooting, you know, and let's get let's I'll pick up a script that's on my machine and, and we'll go and do some filming around London with some nice sights in the background. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it does feel like a hobby, but one of my other hobbies is playing the flute, but no one's going to pay me 10 grand a month to play the flute. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's actually quite a nice lifestyle and I like that balance of of you know, occasionally going into big corporate environments and doing face-to-face -face training and then just being able to spend the day pretending to be a TV presenter talking about writing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I think that's great. I think it, having that balance between online teaching and some other work where you can stay sort of in your industry or just stay, I don't know, sometimes I've I've transitioned to so much of my time is online teaching that uh, it would be good to go back and just do some more freelance work, film production yeah. work. And I actually have a few few things lined up later this month that I'm excited for, even though I was kind of stressed taking them on because I was like, oh, I have so much other stuff to do. But I just have to like, OK, I need to like step away sometimes. So yeah. that's yeah. good. That's yeah. good. So um, you talked about scripting. Do you have any advice for people scripting their courses? Um, do you, one, use a teleprompter when you're actually recording? And then also just, I don't know, any other advice for how to script a course? So um, wh what I do, with, and it's something that I learned from that um, weekend how to be a TV presenter course that I went on was I, I tightly, I don't use a teleprompter. Mm -hmm. I tightly script little, little segments. So nothing is, is longer than I can hold in my head and present to camera. So we're talking mm -hmm. maximum 60 words, 60 word snippets. Um, and this probably is one reason why I've only made four courses because it actually is very, very time consuming to assemble that because then you need to insert B roll in between the little snippets. But what it does mean is that, that one of the 
repeated comments that students make in reviews is that they love the bite-sized mm -hmm. micro learning. Um, so I never repeat myself. It's all super, super tightly scripted. So if you're going to go, I mean, I would recommend going down the scripting route, but then I probably would say that being a, a writer and I'm much better with the written word than I am ad-libbing. If I ad-lib, I will, I will repeat myself and it will be rumbling. And so it keeps me very, very, um, you know, focused on on what that lecture is trying to achieve um yeah, so yeah, yeah. So bite-sized nuggets and then b-roll i think it is more time scripting up front but then at the end you have you, this nicely recorded piece on the other hand if you don't script you do end up rambling and you have to edit it down and usually it just doesn't end up as high quality yeah. i would say yeah. as writing down and i like the idea that you're saying it's not just you're just reading off of a teleprompter and i feel like it's kind of similar to what i do where i have this nice tight outline that gives me all the points that i need to say and then i kind of go point by point yeah so i don't ramble but it's also not like i'm robotic reading on yes. a teleprompter yeah, yeah. cool yeah. so what about now you're on udemy and you made ten thousand dollars in a month are you what are your plans from here on Udemy and are you thinking of, about expanding elsewhere? Are your courses on any other platforms right now? They aren't at the moment and I'm fully aware that I need to, you know, maybe incorporate some platform agnosticism into my business model if that's what you can call it in my slightly disorganized uh, hobbyist fashion. Um, so yeah, I am aware that I probably need to look at other platforms. And it's just a matter of finding the time in between that and serving my corporate clients and improving the course and making other courses. So that's definitely something that's on the horizon. Um, it's just a matter of getting around to doing it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Where is the time? Where is the time? Yeah. So yeah. you have your blog too. So this is where you kind of started out yeah. Are you, what other ways are you building your brand and promoting your courses yourself? Um, well, I'm very active on social media, um, tweet, tweeting and Facebooking and LinkedIn every day. Um, and I've recently launched a YouTube channel, still building up subscribers. Um, you can find it by Googling Claire Lynch. I'm not the bluegrass singer. It's a different Claire Lynch. Um, and um, so that's sort of slowly building a little bit of traction. And, um, you know, I, I feel that's one of those those little things that are adding to this confluence of of influences that's, that's making the course take off. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's slowly, slowly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So on your blog, when you launched it, and I don't know if it's different now, but how did you actually launch your course to your audience? Like what, I don't know, what price were you promoting at? And was it just an email out of the blue that said, here's a course? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> and I can't actually remember how much I offered it probably for for some, you know, it was probably 15 or 20. I think it might, I think it might have been 19 pounds originally. Um, then I sent it to this. I had a small um, but very, very engaged email list. So I think at that time there were about 700 people on that email list that had been built up over, you know, a course of several years. And um, one of my early frustrations with my blog um, was that the only people who used to read it was other writers. So I've actually since change the focus of the right of the of the blog to make it more about how to write in the workplace rather than just rants about jog and which is what it initially was um but but as i say yeah it was a small list but um i made 900 sales from from a list of 700 people which actually i think is probably a sign that they were very very engaged but i think that's because the content of the blog was always very good. So it's it's the same as, you know, making a, you have to make a great course. You have to have a great blog. You have to provide value when it comes to, to the content. Yeah. And even I'm going through this whole transformation myself with my website. And I feel like I've strayed away from really creating high quality content on my website. So it's it's kind of a constant battle. And at the end of the day, though, it's just not worth it to kind of write sloppy, short, not really engaging 
blog posts because yeah. it might feel like you're being productive and feel like you're putting stuff out to the world, but <laughs> it's not going to help you in the long run, it seems yeah. like anyways. Yeah. So yeah. and your email list, you just talked about it being engaging. What what would you say makes that engaging? How often are you emailing? What are you emailing to your list? Well, again, it's, you know, I'm very, very haphazard about it. I don't have a calendar of things that I'll send, but, you know, I will get my inspiration for blog posts. Uh, students are a great source of information. You know, the same questions crop up time and time again, whether it's a student that I'm working with, um, that I'm coaching one-to-one in the real world or, or a student question. Uh, that's your best source of content. And actually, one of the things that I tell people that I'm training to write is that the best source of the written word for you, whether you're you're promoting a business or whether you're communicating to your employees or whether you've got a blog, uh, your readers are your best source of content. The, the way they express themselves, the stuff they're interested in, that's where you get your ideas. So I get my ideas for, for my blog posts, for my lectures, for my YouTube videos from what people ask me. Um, you know, the same questions crop up over and over again. How long does it take to write something? How can I make it easier to write something? Yeah. Great, great. Yeah. So yeah. what are the next few years like for you? You got plans for more courses? Just keep improving the current courses? Anything uh, specific? Um, yep, yeah, keep improving the, the fourth bridge course. Um just keep um just keep polishing that till I'm till I'm happy with it, which I'm sure I never will be. Um but you know. And uh, look looking to produce a, a bigger course on, on punctuation. And you know, I've got loads of course ideas sort of jotted down in notebooks. It's just a question of finding the time. But um yeah. Well, it seems like you're doing really well. So just a couple more questions. Uh, what if you're talking to someone listening who's brand new, I get a lot of people who are just starting out who are in that point where you were seven, eight months ago, where you'd been on Udemy for a while, not getting too many sales. It feels like nothing is going right. What, what do you tell them? What do you tell them to do or just help them to keep going? Well, I mean, I just, one of the things that it, one of the early lectures in my big flagship course is about the importance of editing and the importance of constant improvement. Um, so uh, one of the uh, something that my PhD supervisor used to say to me when I was writing my PhD all those years ago was, Claire, don't get it right, get it written. So, you know, just get something out there but go back and improve it. Um, and that, that's what's worked for me. That's what works for, for me as a writer. It's what works for me as a Udemy instructor is just constantly improving and thinking about how can I add more value? Listen to your students. What are, what are they telling you they want? Listen to the feedback, you know, read the, sometimes we all get ratings that sting and they're, they're horrible. And a lot of them you can ignore because there are trolls. Um, but 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 the ones that, you know, that those ratings that are sort of three and a half where they kind of like the course but have suggestions, listen to those suggestions. Listen to what people are, are telling you. And don't, I, I don't know, with the whole star instructor thing, I, I don't really see that star instructor as my competition. Another thing I talk about in the course is um, how it, when you're writing something, you have to think that you're you're you have to grab your reader's attention and you have to see your competitor as a writer as facebook as uh, downton abbey as pokemon minecraft or whatever it is people would much rather be doing than reading your stuff and frankly there's so many things i'd rather do than watch a middle-aged woman talking about how to write uh, so how can you make it interesting and engaging? And so I see my competitors not as the star instructor on Udemy, but as I don't know if you've heard of Mary Beard, who's a, a BB, she's a Cambridge Don who makes programs about history, about ancient history. But they're incredibly engaging. Uh, you know, they're they're on the BBC and they're interesting and engaging. And and that's that's the kind of level I'm aiming at. So just just make it interesting and engaging and fun and just think, what would I want to watch? What would I want to 
what would I want to sit and spend two, three hours doing on a, you know, on a Wednesday night? I love it. I love it. And I'm just thinking about how, you know, that star instructor might have 50,000 students in their class, but there's millions of other people who are watching Netflix on Facebook, doing other things that, you know, are distracted. That's like you said, that's, yeah. the, that's the competition that we're all kind of yeah. trying to fight yeah. with. So I, I love it. I love it. So where can people find you? I'm sure people are going to be interested in looking at your courses and your website to see more about you. Yeah. So, um, Find me on YouTube, Google Claire Lynch, not the bluegrass singer. Um, I'm on Twitter, at, and my Twitter handle is at Doris and Bertie, which is the name of my company. Um, my, if you go to dorisandbertie.com, that's my blog, my website, and we have a blog that's called Good Copy, Bad Copy, and my courses are all up there, and um, blog posts are up there as well and there's lots of sort of information about how to how to write well up there and downloads and stuff so that's where i am perfect and i'll include links to all of that at onlinecoursemasters.com so claire it's been awesome chatting and i can't wait to see you at udemy live this year and actually i think this episode is probably i've been batch recording a lot of these episodes so this episode might be coming out right around there right before i think so for people listening we're going to be probably sharing a beer at Udemy Live in July, <laughs> right around this time. So, yeah, I'm you. buying. Okay. <laughs> I'll buy around two. Thank you so much, Claire, for being on the show. And I can't wait to see your success in the future. Okay, great. Nice book talking to you. I hope you enjoyed that episode. As always, if you want to fast track your success, head over to onlinecoursemasters.com and sign up for your free trial of my flagship program, the Online Course Masters Masterclass. Yep, that's right. It's a masterclass designed to take you from zero to hero, creating and selling your very own online courses. If you haven't done so yet, please leave a review for this show wherever you listen. This is how we can help expand our audience and help teach the world. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week in the next edition of the Online Course Masters Show.